What's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? Why can't women become priests? Why do Catholics worship Mary? Why do I need to confess my sins to a priest? Where is purgatory in the Bible? I think the Pope has too much authority. What's stopping you? You are called to communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Hey everybody, welcome again to Call to Communion here on EWTN. It's the program for our non-Catholic brothers and sisters. Is that you? Are you a non-Catholic? Maybe you were an active Catholic years ago, fell away for whatever reason. Maybe you've never been a Catholic, uh, and yet you've got questions about the Catholic faith, and you really don't know where to get those questions answered. Well, hey, we are here for you. Here's our phone number, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. If you're listening outside of North America, please dial 1 and then 205-271-2985. If you're watching us on TV today, your best uh, best way to get through to us is uh, via email. The address for that, ctc at ewtn.com. Charles Beery is our producer. Matt Kabinsky is our phone screener. Jeff Burson handles social media for us. If you want to ask a question via YouTube or Facebook, we are streaming there right now. Just put your question in the comments box. Jeff will see that. He'll send it to us here in the studio. Hopefully we can get all these questions answered on today's program. I'm Tom Price along with Dr. David Anders. Tom, how are you today? Very well. How are you, sir? I'm hanging in there. Thank you. Interesting question here from Brad, who says, why does the Roman Catholic Church diminish the importance of Scripture in the Christian life? Yeah, thanks. I really appreciate the question. N not sure what we're talking about here. Me right? neither. Because yeah. if, uh, first of all, if you've ever attended a, a Roman Catholic liturgy, you will know that one of the high points of the liturgy, when we all get up out of our, out of our seats and stand and cross ourselves, is the reading of the gospel, which is preceded by I mean, the gospel being processed into the church. And, yes. and we, even, we even keep the gospel readings usually in their own specially bound volume that's in, in, embossed and very ornate. And, yeah. and, uh, and to highlight the special status of the gospel text, sometimes the priest will even chant it to really signify and, and incense the pages. Is this, how many tokens do you need to say, <laughs> wake up everybody, pay attention, this is really important. Yes. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, we really, really emphasize the proclamation of the written text uh, in the liturgy. And, and not only the reading of the gospel, but your typical Catholic Mass just contains more stated, verbalized, articulated passages of Scripture than than almost any evangelical Protestant church I've ever been to in my life. It was, it was very common when I was an evangelical Protestant to go to a worship service, and there might be a long period of singing, um, and then there would be a long homily, but the homily would often be on maybe just a single verse of the Bible. And so when it came to how much Scripture did we actually read corporately in the worship service, sometimes mm -hmm. it might be you know no more than a sentence. Whereas in the Catholic Church, you're going to get paragraph upon paragraph yeah. of, uh, of Scripture reading uh, in, in every single liturgy, which, of course, takes place daily within the Church. Um, so outside of the Mass, the, the, the daily prayer of the Church that's not liturgical is what we call the divine office, and, or not sacramental, I should say, is what we call the divine office. And it's literally huge passages of the Bible read at multiple steps throughout the day every single day. And, of course, the, uh, most Protestants object to the practice of the Church granting indulgences, but the Church grants indulgences for things that it wants Catholics to do. Mm -hmm. And you can actually gain a plenary indulgence in the Catholic faith by reading sacred scripture, right, for a suitable length of time. And, uh, and, and, and the popes, the councils, and the bishops encourage the lay faithful to make scripture part of their life. Now, th there are some ways of encountering the Bible that are not authentically Catholic. Uh, one of them that, you know, I used to encounter in the evangelical world is what I'll call Bible divination, all right? And this would be, you know, the person that, that opens up the, pa the pages of the scripture kind of at random and lets their eyes fall down in the middle of the page and assumes that whatever they find there taken out of context is God's personal word to them today, right? Yeah. And so there's a kind of, uh, you know, magic eight ball approach to the Bible that was <laughs> common in 
my church in evangelical Protestantism, we don't we don't encourage that. We we think you ought to read the whole Bible in context and 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 with a sensitivity to its canonical structure in accord with sacred tradition. But uh, but that's a way of reading the Bible that we don't engage. Uh, some Protestants view the Bible as a kind of not only as the guidebook on Christian life, but the kind of all sufficient guide to everything human. So, you know, you have a question about geology or the age of the earth or anthropology or something that you could only find that from the book of Genesis. And uh, Catholics don't look at the Bible that way. You know, we think the Bible is a liturgical, devotional, theological book that's there to uh, elevate our minds to God and the imitation of the life of Christ and to adhere to his teachings. But we, we also think you can use human reason and science and mm -hmm. philosophy and other modes of critical engagement, of rational engagement with the world. So there are ways of approaching Scripture that are different. Um, but in terms of actually venerating the Bible, the reason the Protestant Church has the Bible that it has today is because the Catholic Church put it together and promulgated it to the world as the Word of God. Yes, indeed. Uh, Brad, thanks so much uh, for your question. Here's an interesting uh, anonymous emailer who says, could you suggest a good book on St. Teresa of Avila that your wife Jill found influential to her? You talked about this in your book, The Catholic Church Saved My Marriage. Oh, yeah, sure. So anyone who is interested in Teresa of Avila should read Teresa of Avila. Yeah. Um, now, I'm going to give you some secondary works as, as well. So you should read the, the, the Book of My Life, Teresa's Book of My Life, her interior castle, her way of perfection, all those books you should read. Um, and with this caveat, Teresa is a wonderful Christian mystic and a terrible writer. So, I mean, she's really not a good writer, and she did not write systematically. And she would, she would sit down and write a paragraph and then put the manuscript down and come back to it three weeks later and say, well, I've totally forgotten what I was writing about, but I'm not going to go reread what I wrote, so here's what I'm on about today. You wow. Know? So there's kind of a haphazardness sometimes to her writing. Um, and, uh, and she invents an idiosyncratic vocabulary, which a lot of thinkers do, you know, so she'll use a lot of terminology, and you're like, well, what does this mean? I don't, I've never heard this term before. Well, no one else has either, right? So you're in good company. Don't worry about mm. that. But if you can really get to the substance of it, um, you, you got to read Teresa directly. Um, so Father Thomas Dubay, uh, deceased, who was a frequent guest on EWTN mm -hmm. when he was alive, uh, uh, loved Teresa of Avila and wrote a magnificent book about Carmelite spirituality called, um, oh my gosh. My, Fire Within? That's the one, Fire Within. Yeah. Fire Within. So uh, Thomas Dubé's uh, introduction to Carmelite spirituality, Fire, Fire Within, that'd be a great introduction to that uh, secondary work. A couple of good resources for you there. Thanks so much uh, for your email. In a moment, we're going to get to the phones. We'll talk with Charles in San Diego. A couple lines open for you as well. If you have a question for Dr. David Anders, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. If you're watching on TV, please send us an email, ctc at ewtn.com. Back in just a moment, lots more here on Call to Communion. It's Call to Communion with Dr. David Andrews here on EWTN. If you're ready now, let's go to the phones at 833 288-EWTN. We begin today with Charles in San Diego, listening online, EWTN.com. Hey there, Charles. What's on your mind today, sir? Hi, Tom and Dr. Anders. I, I talk, I really like you guys a lot. I always go to you for questions, but I talked to you May 5th into the seg segment about my church, and they, they weren't treating me well, so I went to another church because you told me to. And then now I'm just going to, um, I went back because it's so close, but now I'm not every day. And now I'm going to a Christian church. It's Dr. Jeremiah's church. And it's just about, the it's Christianity, and it's really good. I like it. I, I got a mentor, mentor, and they really, they're really nice. And, and they don't have purgatory. They don't have, they don't pray for the dead. And they don't have confession. You just pray to God. And I was just wondering if that's all right. Because the Bible says, I see it, that you, you pray to directly to Jesus, and that's what they say. And I just want to know about that. Yeah, you thanks, Charles. I, I really appreciate the question a lot. Thank you so much for calling. So I'm, I sure am sorry that you weren't treated well at your Catholic parish. I, I really, that really makes me sad, and I'm, I hate to hear that. And uh, I'm not surprised that you found a, a non-Catholic church where, you know, people were friendly to you. 
and that's really attractive to you. And that's that's been attractive to a lot of people who've walked away from the Catholic Church. They go to another church, and someone reaches out to them in a human way, and and they uh, and they get drawn in that way, and then they get they get indoctrinated into the teaching of this other of this other community. So I, I've seen that happen many times, and I'm I'm sympathetic to your motivations for for being drawn in in that way. But w- what do I think about it? Well, um, you've you've put your finger on a key difference, right? That in this other community there are there are Catholic practices and doctrines that are not taught, and and you suggested at least your tone of voice to me suggested that you thought maybe that was a good thing. That hey, well, they don't have purgatory or prayers to the saints or confession. But I have to confess when I hear that, I think, oh, poor them. Yeah. Poor them. I'm so sorry that they that they left out these essential elements of the Christian faith. How sad that they don't have confession, right? How sad that then the other things they don't have either. They don't have real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Right. They don't have ordination. They don't have a holy anointing. They don't have the sacrament of matrimony in quite the same way we do. They, you know, have a different understanding of baptism. They don't. I mean, they're really lacking a lot. And and those things were given to us by Christ. I mean, the first thing that Jesus did when he rose from the dead, he appeared to the disciples in the upper room. And the first thing he said was not, you know, hey, here's a here's a good plan for a church potluck. He didn't do that. He, he said, receive the Holy Spirit, whoever sins you forgive are forgiven. So giving the church the sacrament of reconciliation or the sacrament of penance or confession was the first thing he did after he rose from the dead. Now, why would he do that if he didn't intend for us to use that gift, right? Now, you, you mentioned that your new friends pray directly to God. Well, I, I sure hope that as a Catholic, you pray directly to God. Nothing in the Catholic faith says we're not to pray directly to God. Of course, we, of course, we pray directly to God. But when I pray directly to God, God doesn't typically speak back to me in an audible voice. Right. But He does that through the person of His minister, who He's empowered to pronounce forgiveness of sins in His name. Doesn't mean I will never get my sins forgiven praying directly to God, but but I'll never know. Right. I don't have that confidence, that assurance that can come with a sacrament where God has attached a promise of grace to a tangible or audible or sensible sign. So when I go to confession and the priest says, I absolve you of your sins, I know that comes with the promise of Christ attached to it so I can have objective certainty that my sins are forgiven. And there, there are other things about the sacrament of confession that are really beneficial for me. Well, one of them is that, you know, when I used to be a Protestant before I was Catholic, Oh, I confess my sins all right, but often in a kind of general way. Well, you know, Lord, I know I'm a sinner, and please forgive me. As a Catholic, I really have to do what's called an examination of conscience. It's an occasion for me to really look through my life and figure out what do I need to fix? What do I need to bring to the tribunal of God's mercy? Mm, yeah. And then, of course, I make this act of humility of saying what I've done to another human being. And that, you know, that, that's, that can be difficult, might even be unpleasant for some people, but uh, but... You know, even the secular social science research shows that that accountability to another human being is the best way to make progress whenever we're trying to change some personal behavior. So there's, there's so much about the sacrament of confession that Christ gave us uh, that is salutary, that's really beneficial for the human soul. So, um, you know, I'm, it's good to have friends. Uh, I'm sorry that the Catholic faith didn't go your way in that regard. Uh, but I personally, I would regard the doctrine that you're being given in this new community as a step away from authentic Christianity. And, and I know a lot of the things that these kinds of churches teach. And I, under, I know the arguments and the reasons that they give for their positions. And I'm happy to talk about any of those on the air, t- their view of the Bible, their view of salvation, mm-hmm. their view of confession. I can go on to any of those details. But the long and the short of it is, overall, I think you're being sold a bill of goods. And I think it's persuasive because to you, right, with your state of life, because it's packaged with a friendly face and with really good rhetoric, right? But I don't think it, I don't think it holds water. I don't think it, it, it holds together with Scripture, ultimately, or with reason, and certainly not with the history of Christianity. So I, I don't regard it as, on balance, a good thing, but I recognize the real problem that you've got in your Catholic parish of not maybe not feeling welcome. And so my, my recommendation would be don't give up on the Catholic Church, uh, but continually to explore new modes of engagement with your Catholic faith so that you can find uh, uh, an answer to those spiritual needs that you felt were not, were not being met. So there may be other 
other social groups, for example, mm -hmm. within your Catholic parish or the larger Catholic community that you could get plugged into where you could feel that sense of welcome and community, even if it's not happening at your local parish. Charles, we hope that's helpful for you. Thanks so much for your call. Glad you're checking in there in San Diego. Hey, that opens up a line for you right now at 833-288-3986. Great time to call. We have three lines open, 833 833- 288-EWTN. Call to communion here on EWTN with Dr. David Anders. Let's go now to Las Vegas, talk with Joseph watching us on YouTube today. Hello, Joseph. What's on your mind today, sir? Well, good morning, Dr. Uh, well, morning for me, uh, Tom and Dr. Anders. Well, Dr. Anders, you know who I am, but I'm just going to get right to the question. Um, so I got a good friend of ours, you know, comes to the parish, and you know what uh, right I'm from. Uh, you know, good friend, we, we were on the phone yesterday, and you, I know you always talk about on your show about, you know, the sacred reservation of the Holy of Holy Communion that, you know, only certain people should receive communion. And, you know, that topic came up yesterday, and he started talking to me about, you know, how the Church, about how the Church has rules that, you know, Jesus, um, and I don't agree with any of this, Jesus would have not um, taken Holy Communion away from people. He would have he loves everybody. He would have just given everybody communion and that, you know, if the church really loves Christ, they should allow, you know, gay marriage in the church. And, you know, that um, if that, that, that Jesus never said, you know, hold communion from people, that, you know, he would give a Jew communion or a Buddhist communion. And I refuted all of those claims and said, well, clearly you're coming at me with scripture, but you don't have, you don't, you forget where Jesus says that, you know, not all people are fit for Holy Communion. You know, you should, he said, you know, if somebody goes against the Church, you know, you should, you know, consult the, with them with two or three witnesses, you know, uh, you know, kick them out. And so the basis is of his is that Jesus would have loved and accepted everybody to Communion and that, you know, it's okay to have gay marriage in the Church. And, it, it you know, because Jesus is love and that, you know, the Church should focus less on the sacraments, and they should fo focus more on community and having, uh, getting out to people by having breakfast after mass. And his just his theology is all wrong. And I, you know, he's an older guy, and I don't really want to argue with him. But maybe you can defend me right on the air. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate the question. So um, I'm going to say something that's going to seem controversial. That I'm going to defend it. Jesus was an elitist. He was unambiguously an elitist. He wasn't an elitist in the sense that we think of the elite today. He, he wasn't an elitist who was, you know, sort of uh, supporting the power elite of his own day or the intellectual elite or even the religious elite. But he absolutely had a conception of religious life where he was constructing a new hierarchy of values in which there were elites and outcasts, un unambiguously, although they, it, it reversed the expectations of his contemporaries. And one of the clearest passages in the gospel about this is Matthew chapter 13. Well, we know from all the gospels that Jesus taught the people in parables. Mark says that he never taught anything without using a parable. And in Matthew, the, the disciples come to Christ and they say, why are you teaching in parables? Now, if you ask the average person on the street, why did Jesus teach in parables? You'll, you'll probably hear what, what I heard from one of my fellow TAs when I was in grad school who was not a student of Christianity, by the way. Oh, well, he must teach in parables because they're easy to understand. I've, I've, heard, that, I've heard that from a lot of people. Well, you know, parables are stories, and they're like Aesop's fables, you know, and a kid can follow that. And, uh, you know, we'll have a parable of Jesus and some sheep and some flannel graphs and some Elmer's glue and some coloring sticks, <laughs> and that's the way we present the gospel. The problem with that is that Jesus says the exact opposite. He says that I, uh, I, I teach in parables... Um, uh, so that those who see will not see and those who hear will not hear because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you disciples, but not to them. In other words, Christ says, I teach in parables because they're hard to understand and I will unveil the meaning of the parable only to the initiates, only to, the, only to my disciples, not to the people on the outside, mm -hmm. right? There is an elitism and a, and a kind of inner sanctum, an inner group, an inner, inner ring to Jesus' teaching. Um, to which he admits and excludes. And the, the church has actually always followed that practice. In antiquity, there was something called the Disciplina Arcani, where the, the, the mysteries of the faith were withheld from outsiders and only revealed to initiates after baptism. 
And there, there are remnants of this in the Catholic tradition to this day. I know in the, in the Eastern, I don't think the Maronite liturgy has this, but the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom has a place in it where the deacon cries out, the door is the doors. And that was a reference to closing the doors to keep out the uninitiated, only mm -hmm. reveal the secrets to those that were on the inside. Um, and then, of course, Jesus gives explicit instructions for kicking people out of that inner sanctum, of that inner ring, if they don't toe the line. So, um, you know, he, uh, Matthew 18, which you re correctly referenced, he, he says, if, if they're unrepentant, you kick them out, treat them like a tax collector or a sinner or a Pharisee. And, uh, it, you know, the idea that Jesus never passed judgment on people is just patently wrong. I mean, Matthew 23 uh, has a series of woes. Woe to you, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you. Um, and he concludes, woe to you, you snakes, you brood of vipers. How will you escape being condemned to hell? Ooh, right. Um, and on, on you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly, I tell you, all this will come on this generation. I mean, you talk about hellfire and brimstone. Yeah. I mean, Christ, Christ, there was absolutely a judgmental element to Jesus's teaching. There was an elitist element. There was an us versus them element. All of that is in Christ's teaching. But here's where it overturns the expectations of his contemporaries. That, that you know, the gospel we read this weekend in the Latin rite of the church was about uh, the workers in the vineyard. And some come late and some come early and they mm. all get rewarded. And the ones who come early are resentful against the ones that come late. And that's consistent with uh, the overall message of Jesus, which was that people who thought that they were in the inner ring were not. And people who thought themselves excluded actually were. And so Christ spent his time among the poor and the lame and the blind and those rejected and marginalized like the prostitutes and the sinners and the tax collectors and said they are getting into heaven ahead of the scribes and Pharisees who considered themselves righteous because of their adherence to the ritual prescriptions of the Mosaic law and their own sense of uh, self-importance. Um, but that Jesus, you know, did not have an undifferentiated, undifferentiated goodwill and acceptance to everybody, that, that, that's patently obvious from the text. Very good. And we thank you, Joseph, for your call. Glad you're checking in from Las Vegas. Call to communion here on EWTN. We do have a couple of lines open at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. We'll get back to the phones in a second. Here's an email from Adam. I'm a cradle Catholic who would love to explain the importance of the Council of Chalcedon to my Oriental Orthodox brethren. That would be uh, Coptic, Syriac, uh, et cetera. What is the best way to broach this subject? As you may know, Oriental Orthodoxy split in 451. Yeah, thanks. So, uh, you know, to be honest with you, I, I don't know why you would want to broach the topic. <laughs> I really don't, you know. I mean, there is an ecumenical dialogue that takes place at very high levels you know, of the hierarchy with representatives of the Holy See and uh -huh. members of these separated Eastern communities mm. in which they have very, very lengthy and highly complicated discussions about about uh, Christology and the Council of Chalcedon and mostly looking for common ground and not looking to establish points of difference. And the church has told us uh, Latin Rite Catholics that we are explicitly not to engage in proselytism of of Eastern Rite Christians or Eastern Christians. So our, our goal in dialoguing with whether they be Coptic Christians or even or Byzantine Christians is not to make them Catholic, that they were not to do that, 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 that the reunion that we seek as, as members of the body of Christ is going to be negotiated at the upper echelons mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. and not by way of one on one proselytizing, but rather to look for points of commonality to live our common Christian faith, because these are genuine churches. They have apostolic succession in the sacraments. And so we don't we don't regard them as is you know total aliens to the Christian faith you know and objects of conversion and so forth, uh, but uh, but if you if you do want theological resources the best discussion on the the differences between uh, the Western Church the Catholic Church and the Eastern Churches is Aidan Nichols' book Rome and the Eastern Churches it's a fantastic resource I highly recommend it very good uh, Adam thanks so much uh, for your email and if you'd like to send us an email for a future show I'd love to hear from you and the address CTC at EWTN.com, ctc at EWTN.com. We try to uh, tackle a couple of emails
emails on each of our shows, and then once a month or so, we'll uh, dip into the mailbag, shake it loose, and let it fall. Let all get all those emails out of there, and then uh, answer a whole bunch of emails about once a month or so. In a moment, back to the phones, and we'll talk with uh, Aubrey in Detroit, Mary in Allentown, New Jersey, Judy in Freehold, New Jersey, and when a line becomes available, our phone number 833-288-EWTN for Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders here on EWTN. Stay with us. It's Call to Communion here on EWTN. Our phone number 833-288-EWTN. That's 833 833- 288-3986. Congratulations going out to a longtime member of the EWTN radio family, Salt and Light Radio in Idaho, celebrating their 14th year with EWTN. They are now heard on nine AM and FM stations in English and Spanish. Congratulations to our friend Keith Pettyjohn and his great team there at Salt and Light Radio from all your friends here at EWTN. Back to the phones now. Let's go to Judy in Freehold, New Jersey, listening on the EWTN app. Hey there, Judy. What's on your mind today? Good afternoon, Dr. Anders. I'm calling because I'm in a small group. I'm a Catholic. All of us are Catholic within the group. And at our last meeting, somebody brought up that there are manuscripts that have been discovered written by our Lord Jesus himself. Uh, She said, many researchers are looking into this, and I thought, if anybody can help with that, it would be you, Dr. Anders, because I've never heard a thing about it. Thank you. Um, Yeah, thank you. Uh, So I am not aware of any recent claim in archaeology to have discovered manuscripts uh, of of Jesus' writing. Um, You know, there is an ancient legend that Christ wrote a letter to King Agbar of the Armenians, that is widely regarded to be spurious. Uh, you know, from time to time, it's not uncommon for biblical scholars and archaeologists to come up with some find that they pull out of a cave somewhere and declare this is some something that overturns, you know, the ancient Christian tradition on this side of the other thing. Uh, you know, I put very little stock in that. Uh, so there's no there's no manifest evidence that I'm aware that Christ wrote anything, and um, and you know, surely if he had. Um, it's 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 completely implausible that his disciples wouldn't have cherished these things and passed them on. Right? Sure. Um, but in fact, the record we have of Christ tells us that the way he pro- propagated his teaching was by forming a community of disciples and appointing successors and commanding that they go forth and teach everything he had commanded, which, of course, was all a world tradition. Hmm. All right, uh, Judy, there you go. Is that helpful for you, Judy? Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Have a great day. Appreciate your call. Let's go to Aubrey now, a first-time caller in Detroit, watching on EWTN television today. Uh, Aubrey, what's on your mind today? Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Anders. How you doing? Great. Thanks. How about you? Um, for the past year, I've been watching EWTN, and I've been listening, and I've been watching Mother Angelica for the past year as well. So I like what I hear. You know, I like what they talk about, but in my mind, I always thought that in order for you to be Catholic, you had to be white. Now, this now this is not to say that, you know, I don't believe, you know, because I do because of the things that I hear. And I was wondering how, you know, if uh, I can get into Catholic Church. Oh, yeah, thanks. I really appreciate the question. So, so n- not only do you not have to be white to be Catholic, most Catholics are not white. Most Catholics are not white. Uh, most Catholics today are are from Africa and from Asia and from Latin America, right? And so white mm-hmm. Catholics are actually a minority worldwide. And going back in history, I mean, Jesus was clearly not, you know, he was swarthy. You know, he would have been of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Middle Eastern descent and, and Semitic descent. So he, you know, he didn't look like some pasty white Northern European, to be sure, <laughs> you know. Um, and uh, and we have uh, we've had African popes, uh, we had at least three African popes in history. Um, we've had many great saints of African ancestry. So probably the greatest saint and uh, the greatest theologian in Catholic Western history is Augustine of Hippo, and uh, he was North African. Um, uh, you know, one of the really influential early monastic leaders was a character who was called Moses the Black. 
um, he was probably Ethiopian, uh, Athanasius, who was the greatest theologian of the fourth century and really single-handedly responsible for promoting the, the Nicene understanding of the Trinity, uh, was was called um, Athanasius the Black Dwarf by his contemporaries because he was a short, dark-skinned individual. Mm -hmm. um, we've got, I mean, I could just go down the list and we could just start naming famous uh, black and other non-white saints. We have something like 26 African cardinals in the church today. Um, uh, uh, cardinal Wilton Gregory, the Archbishop of Washington, D.C., of course, is a, a black American man. Yes. He's a cardinal in the Catholic Church, which was just about the highest office you can have next to the Pope. I mean, I, I could do this all day. I mean, I well, all right, day. right here on EWTN, on radio and television, we have had black hosts of on, course. on many programs. I'm thinking of our friend Deacon Harold Burke Sivers. That's exactly right. You know, in my in my own diocese of Birmingham, Alabama, I mean, we, we don't have a lot of black clergy. We have two black clergymen, some other non-white clergymen. Um, and, uh, and like the, the, the priest who has ministered most recently directly to my family is uh, African. Yes. So, I mean, uh, yeah, you absolutely don't have to be white. Now, uh, if, you, if a person wants to uh, uh, become Catholic in the United States, um, you can walk to any, go up to any parish anywhere in the country and say, I'd like to be received into the Catholic Church, and, and you can certainly, you can do that, and you can join any parish, and typically most parishes are some kind of mixed race. I mean, unless you're, you know, out in the middle of the hinterland where it's, you know, very homogenous culture, that might be different. Um, there are also historically and predominantly black parishes. Now, yes. you, you certainly don't have to do that. I mean, it's not like black Catholics have to go to a black parish. They don't. They can go to any parish they want to go to. Yeah. But some black Catholics in America prefer to worship in historically black parishes because they tend to more intentionally cultivate a connection to African-American history, hymnody, culture, and so forth. There's something, there was a movement in the United States in the late 60s um, called the Black Catholic Movement that was an attempt to really cultivate a distinct black Catholic identity in North America. And so there are, you'll find parishes that are committed to that way of being Catholic. But again, that's just a personal preference that, that no one is obligated to follow. So you can go to an all-white parish if you want to go to. You can go to a mixed-race parish. You can go to a black parish. Um, but the uh, the beautiful thing is that you're interested in the Catholic faith. So one thing I would encourage you to do, and I, I don't know this for a fact, but I suspect that the EWTN bookstore has some information on this, is to look into African-American Catholic history. And there are plenty of resources. I mean, I, I mean I've, there are books upon books upon books on this topic about mm -hmm. you know, the unique cultural contributions of of, uh, of American black Catholics to the universal church. As a matter of fact, we did a series on EWTN television some years ago called Black and Roman Catholic, uh, which is, I'm sure, available on the EWTN website. You know, Martin Luther King Jr. was not a Catholic, to be sure. He was a Baptist. But um, I've always appreciated MLK's theology, and if you've studied MLK, you know that he drew extensively on the Catholic patrimony, the Catholic intellectual tradition, in particular the works of St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Augustine, uh, in, uh, in coming up with his own unique theological contributions. Appreciate your call, Aubrey. Thanks for checking in from Detroit. Call to communion here on EWTN. Let's go now to Mary, a first-time caller in Allentown, New Jersey, listening on the EWTN app. Hey, Mary, what's on your mind today? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. yes, go right ahead. Oh, okay. Hi, Dr. Anders. Hi. Thank you. Thank you so much for all that you do. I occasionally listen to you when I happen to be in the car on my app. Um, I'm a mother of an empty nester of four children, and they're right outside of a couple of years out of college. And um, to my great sorrow, all of them have fallen away from the Catholic Church. And when we have discussions about it, uh, primarily tends to go back to what they're exposed to in college with um, the views on uh, homosexuality and or birth control. Um, I fall so far short of being able to, you know, they give me the look, you know, when <laughs> we, we start to have these discussions that old fashioned, you're not with the culture, the Catholic Church is, you know, they, we don't agree with, you know, the homosexuality, you know, stance and things like that. 
And um, my question is, can you provide me, because they're all very well read and they're searching uh, resources that I could get for them, whether it be video or books that can address some of these issues better than me. Um, yes, but. Yes, but. Uh, there, of course, there's plenty of such resources. I, I, I don't necessarily think that handing your adult children Catholic literature on Catholic moral theology is the is the best way to engage them honestly and and you know the reason I think that is that it sounds like they're not as Tom likes to say in receive mode at the yeah, moment yeah and and you know they're they're probably going to respond to that not with an open mind they're not going to go oh here's a Here's an interesting book defending the church's moral theology. I think I'll read it with an open mind and allow myself to be persuaded. Uh, that's probably not the response you're going to get. You're, a, they probably won't read it. And if they do read it, they're going to read it with a polemical, aggressive tone, and, and they'll be looking to refute rather than to engage. Mm, right? Guards up. The man. guard's going to be up, exactly. And so I, you know, I, I think the, the best way to handle the faith lives of adult children who've left the faith is by continuing to live your own faith generously and to demonstrate by your actions as well as your words that you continue to love and accept your children, um, you know, regardless of where they are, and, and to kind of try to be the face of Christ's mercy to them. Um, so that that's really my counsel. And, uh, you know, are there great books defending Catholic moral theology? Absolutely. But I, I don't typically advise people to start handing them out to people who left the church in the hopes that we can persuade them to come back. I mean, you, they have to be open to that conversation first. When they start asking for books, that's, that's when you want to give the books. Sure, sure. Mary, God bless you. Thank you so much for your call today. It is a call to communion here on EWTN. Let me tell you about a new book now available from EWTN Publishing, and that is 30 Marian Eucharistic Visits by Donna Marie Cooper O'Boyle. In this great new book, you'll find ways to rekindle the fire of divine love in your prayer life, and you'll grow in loving communion with our Lord in the Eucharist. You'll also be inspired by moving stories of saints, including Faustina, the Fatima children, Pope John Paul II, and you'll learn how to apply them to your daily faith journey. And by the way, this is an ideal resource for the Eucharistic revival. Check out this great book, 30 Marian Eucharistic Visits by Donna Marie Cooper O'Boyle. It's a new book now from EWTN Publishing, available at EWTNRC.com. Buy Catholic, shop Catholic, EWTNRC.com. All right, back to the phones now for uh, Justin, a first-time caller from Kelowna in uh, British Columbia, watching us today on YouTube. Hey, Justin, what's on your mind today? Hi there. Just curious uh, what your opinion is on the Pilgrim's Progress from a Catholic perspective. Thank you. Um, I despise Pilgrim's Progress. Oh, my. I, I won't, I won't uh, put it any, any more mildly <laughs> than that, right? Yeah, I, I was raised on Pilgrim's Progress, of course, growing up in a Presbyterian uh, evangelical school, and we were taught to venerate this text as a kind of beautiful allegory for the Christian life. Um, I, I think it is no such thing. I, I think it is an apology for Puritanism, and uh, which I regard as one of the most pernicious theological and spiritual movements ever to emerge from the heart of Christendom. So I am not a fan of John Bunyan or Pilgrim's Progress or Puritanism in any shape, form, or fashion. And I hope that we, I'm, I'm glad that as a civilization we have gotten beyond Puritanism, and I hope we never go back. David, don't hold back. How, right, well, do, how do you really feel? Yeah, exactly. So let me, <laughs> let, me, let me unpack a little bit about why. Sure, okay? sure. So, you know, Bunyan begins the work with Pilgrim leaving his wife and children and plugging his ears as they cry out after him, screaming, life, life, eternal life, right? So he, he, he abandons his vocation, uh, a family man, to go individualistically seek uh, the solution to the problem of his burdened conscience which he finds in a Puritan presentation of the so-called gospel, right? And, uh, and I, so I think that that whole way of construing the human spiritual dilemma is just wrong, right? That we, that we find our salvation on the path of the moral life, to quote John Paul II, 
which takes place very much in the quotidian day-to-day -day realities of marriage and family and civil society and acts of justice and charity, right? And, and I think that the, that the neurotic conscience that Pilgrim wrestles with is very much a product of Puritanism, right? Not an authentic biblical faith. So the, the kind of um, agonized uh, concern for the question of the assurance of salvation and the, and the sort of Jonathan Edwards sinners in the hands of an angry God style hellfire brimstone sermon and the need to have a kind of absolute certainty, a kind of ray of light from heaven that says, yes, you are saved. Uh, I, I think that whole way of approaching the dynamic of, of spiritual life and conversion is just wrong-headed, right? Um, I, I, I think the proper way to think of it is that, you know, we're seeking to, uh, we, do need, we do need a renovation of our way of looking at ourselves in the world, but it's to come to see the world from Christ's point of view. Uh, ultimately, that we participate in Jesus' own filial relationship to the Father. And like him, we come to appreciate that God uh, causes the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. And like Christ, we, we are not looking for a religious purity as much as we are uh, the love of God and neighbor and to give ourselves in service to the poorest of the poor and the marginalized and those regarded as outcasts, whether they be tax collectors or sinners or prostitutes or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Uh, and imitate the life and character of Jesus, and like I said, uh, sort of participate in his own filial relationship to God the Father. And that's, a, again, that's a very different way of construing the religious life than one that starts with a kind of um, agonized neurotic fear of damnation mm -hmm. and the need for a kind of subjective absolute certainty of salvation based on some interior religious experience that I think is 90 times, 99 times out of 100, a, a spurious religious experience. So, I, uh, And then Puritanism, like all forms of Calvinism, tends to separate the world into the elect and the damned, and it makes the audacious claim that the elect can know for sure they're going to heaven, which is something the Catholic Church has never said. Um, and so uh, it it induces the worst kind of, of snobbery and elitism and has been shown historically to to facilitate uh, grotesque forms of, uh, of discrimination and abuse. Yeah. So I just I'm, I'm not a fan of Calvinism in any shape, form or fashion. I'm not a fan of Puritanism. Uh, and I'm not a fan of the kind of self-righteous egotism that I think the spirituality of something like Binion's Pilgrim Progress uh, absolutely induces and is meant to induce. Justin, thanks for your call from Canada today. It's called to communion here on EWTN. Let's go now to Clay in Philadelphia watching us on YouTube. Hey, Clay, what's on your mind today, sir? Hi. Um, well, my original question is one thing, but I'd love to get your views on Milton later. But <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, no, my, my, my question is, um, so uh, I'm in the ordinariate, and earlier you mentioned that, uh, you know, the hierarchy of the Church at the present moment would rather us not do one-on-one -on -one, um, evangelization of Oriental Orthodox because we prefer corporate reunion. I mean, the you know, there's a very long history of people not becoming Catholic because they were hoping that eventually a corporate reunion would occur. And, you know, the global Anglican communion has not rejoined Rome. Individual churches have, individual pastors, individual people. Um, and, you know, it's funny because I also, I live right down the street from an Armenian Catholic church, and I, I go there sometimes. Um, and, you know, I know that this is a politically fraught history and everything, but uh, I think the existence of that Armenian Catholic church is a good thing. Um, and so, uh, and they get along very well with their Orthodox neighbors. There's an Armenian Orthodox church up the street, too. But, uh, and I, this, maybe this isn't the most coherent question, but, um, you know, I mean, what, what would you... What's the magic number? I mean, 50 Orthodox rejoin the entire global Orthodox communion, one Orthodox guy, an Orthodox fan. You know what I mean? Yeah, is, sure. Is what thanks. I'm so if, so for, I really, really appreciate the question. These are interesting questions. I yeah. like the interesting mm -hmm. ones especially. You know? So uh, first of all, the situation with Anglicans is not analogous to the situation of the Oriental churches. And the reason why is because Anglicans don't have valid apostolic orders. They don't have valid priests or sacraments. So you, you, you can't simply negotiate a settlement with the Archbishop of Canterbury and then, and then gather in all of the, all of the Anglican Church. It, it doesn't work that way in the same way that you could do that with the Orthodox um, because, of course, their Archbishop isn't actually a bishop. He doesn't have apostolic succession. Mm 
Um, and so, uh, and then of course also, uh, Anglicanism falls within the historic jurisdiction of the Bishop of Rome. And so, you know, the ordinariate is not a right in the way that say the Byzantine right or the Coptic right is a right. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really part of the Roman right and it's a, it's a special arrangement within the Roman right and the, and the, and the Latin church, right? So the, 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 the ecclesiastical, jurisdictional, liturgical thing is just different with Anglicans. Um, but in terms of your question, what, what is enough? Well, I don't, like, I know what you're asking, but I'm not so sure that the question makes a lot of sense given the history of, of, uh, of Latin Eastern uh, relations. Because see, we, like you just mentioned, we're like, is it enough that we have the Armenian Catholic Church down the street from your house? Well, I mean, in a sense, like, that's an expression of Catholic unity. I mean, like, we do have the, the 23 sui juris churches that are in union with the Bishop of Rome. There they are. There they are. And if, if there were people in your uh, Armenian Orthodox Church down the street that wanted to reconcile with the Pope, what the Church says they do is they don't come over and join the Latin Rite Church. They just go to the Armenian Rite Catholic Church, and they just make a profession of faith, and there they are. Right? They just walk right over, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so the structures are there. Now, you know, the, the, those your, your, your churches have a history, you know? I mean, except for the Maronites who, who never broke away. All of those have a specific point in time in which their bishops negotiated terms with the Vatican for their reunion. And their stories are different from one another, obviously. And so uh, there can be more of that. Right? There could be more of those kinds of negotiations and mm -hmm. those kinds of reunions. And then there are those existing Surrey Eurus churches that reflect all of the different liturgical rites of, of Christendom. There you go, uh, Clay. Great, great question. Great call. Thanks so much for checking in. Here is Bob now in Northeast Washington listening on the EWTN app. Hey, Bob, what's on your mind today, sir? Yeah, hello, gentlemen. Uh, you know, I'm just calling about a, a caller that called previously. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this gentleman said he had some abrasive uh, treatment from the Catholic Church, and you know I'm sure he could have got the same abrasive treatment from any church. But but what really bothered me about this gentleman's situation is the fact that if he went to a church, uh, you know God sent him to a church, I guess, where he, where he found um, he found people that sh that were showing him the way to God, where he really felt like he was personal with God there, and he he found he found a, a way. And then I, I hear you stop, say that he's been sold a bill of goods um, and that uh, uh, he needs to come back to the Catholic Church. I, I'm, my question is, are only Catholics going to heaven? And you can only go to heaven if you go to a Catholic church. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I feel very sad for this gentleman. Your answer was very appropriate for someone promoting the Catholic Church. I like Catholics, um, but I also like Christians. Yeah, sure. I really appreciate the question a lot. Okay. So there's a famous Catholic theologian, a 13th century theologian named Bonaventure. Bonaventure once wrote, and I concur with this judgment, this is a Catholic judgment, the world, he wrote, the world is a ladder ascending to God. And, and whoops, uh -oh. good idea to turn off your cell phone when you go on television. I would right. recommend it. Yeah. Um, so, so from Bonaventure's point of view, and, f and from mine and from an authentic Catholic point of view, I can, I can literally meet God by staring at a rock. And that is not a false statement. That that I can, I can mount up from contemplation of nature and any concrete particular nature, to an understanding of the being and the nature of God, and that that encounter, with God's grace under extraordinary circumstances, can be salvific. And so the person who's never heard the name of Jesus, can be saved by Jesus by correctly contemplating a rock. However, I don't recommend that as the path, <laughs> right? Because Christ came into the world, was incarnate, to preach the gospel and to establish a church and to give means of grace, precisely so that we're not limited to rocks, that we can have a more or less manifest, more or less clear presentation of the path to God. And of course, there are Protestants that have a saving relationship to God. Of course, there are people from many religious traditions that have a saving relationship to God. But why then the incarnation and the foundation of the church? Christ established a concrete, determinate body with, with specific lines of authority and gave them a commission 
to teach everything he'd commanded, and he would be with them to the end of the age, and whatever they bound on earth would be bound in heaven. And so I, I, I'm always going to recommend that if you have an option between greater fidelity to the teaching of Christ and less fidelity to the teaching of Christ, if you can get like 100% of the gospel or 85%, I'm going to go with the 100 it doesn't mean that the person who's got the 85 is lost, yeah. right? But 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 I'm going to go with the 100. And, and, and so, you know, I don't presume, for example, when you said, well, these people were showing him how to connect to God. That, that's, that's more than I know, right? But I know a lot about those kind of churches because I, I grew up in them and I came out of them before I became Catholic. Mm-hmm. And I can tell you with certainty the church I grew up in, which was a non-Catholic church, taught many things that were an impediment to my relationship with God, even though they claim to ground them in Scripture. So just because somebody is friendly to me and gives a compelling message and claims to establish my relationship with God, I don't take those claims at face value at all. Bob, I wish we had more time, but uh, as you can hear, the music is coming up, so we'll have to leave it right there. But do call us back another time. Love to uh, engage further. We also could not get to Aaron in Laurel, Montana, or David in Atlanta. If you folks could call us back either tomorrow or on the day of your choice, I promise we'll put you at the head of the line. Hey, Dr. David Anders, thank you so much. Thank you, Tom. We do this program on EWTN Radio five days a week, Monday through Friday, 2 p.m. Eastern, right here on EWTN. On behalf of our fantastic team, I'm Tom Price along with Dr. David Anders. We'll see you next time on Call to Communion. Have a great day. God bless.